So, the big idea this week, the people of God. We are the people of God. And it really was a concept that came up during the council, really, was adopted by the council, took over and changed many things. And uh, we live in it today, and I think this is one of those big ideas that we don't give enough credit to yet. We still haven't let it have its full say in the world. So I think it's an exciting one for us to talk about and think about. Uh, I have this here just to... I'm going to quote a lot of the texts and some other texts. And next week I'll have for you a little handout of the texts, so you don't have to worry about getting this down. I'll, I'll have that for you. So the first text I want to talk about is Sacrosanctum Concilium. Two documents came out together uh, after the second session of the Council. Uh, this document, which says what the Council is about and then talks about the liturgy, and then with that came a document on the media and new forms of communication. And you'll see both of those then uh, right at the beginning here. Both of those things important to the Council and in some sense not nearly as controversial as other things. There was a lot of agreement on this, even though we'll see this document is a step ahead. There was complete agreement, and its implications work out through the Council. So, from the opening chapter, or the opening paragraph of the opening document of the Council, the first thing that they put out, we read this. This sacred council has several aims in view. It desires to impart an ever-increasing vigor to Christian life of the faithful. Of course, that's what every council wants to do, right? Two, to adapt more suitably to the needs of our own times those institutions which are subject to change. <laughs> subject to change? <laughs> Surely not the church. Updating to the times. You see, we're already... We're in a new mode already. This is, this is something new. Number three, to foster whatever can promote union among all who believe in Christ, not simply Catholics. I'm not going to follow up this point. We have a whole session on this one, uh, but the beginnings of the ecumenical thinking of the Council is right here in this first paragraph. To strengthen whatever can help to call the whole of mankind into the household of the church, intentionally reaching out to the whole world, inviting them rather than demanding that they come and enter the church. And from this we have a, a new way of speaking in the council, this way of explaining itself in a way that is open, an open invitation, trying to convince people of this beauty that the church sees something new. The Council, therefore, sees particularly cogent reasons for undertaking the reform and promotion of the liturgy. The R word in the first paragraph of the first document, reform. The Council is meaning to reform. It's going to start with reforming the liturgy, but it'll go on to say it's going to do that because it wants the people to reform, and the people are formed by liturgy. So if it wants them to be formed better, to reform themselves, it has to reform the liturgy. Now, this is a term that has a history since the Council, right? Reform. Did the Council reform anything? We'll have a whole, <laughs> we'll have a whole session just on that. Uh, but we need to see at least the beginnings of it here to see what they're doing. So this is a current document. This is from the beginning of Pope Benedict XVI's pontificate. This is an address in December to the Roman Curia. On the one hand, there is an interpretation that I would call a hermeneutic of discontinuity and rupture. It has frequently availed itself the sympathies of the mass media and also one trend of modern theology. On the other, there is the hermeneutic of reform, of renewal in the continuity of the one subject, church, which, is, which the Lord has given to us. 
she is a subject which increases in time and develops, yet always remaining the same, the one subject of the journeying people of God. Now I say this because there was a lot of talk after the, this got out, the, the bullet point that got into the media, the Pope doesn't like a hermeneutic of discontinuity, he wants a hermeneutic of continuity. No, <laughs> there is no hermeneutic of continuity. It's a hermeneutic of reform, which implies then there is continuity and that things change. And it's very explicit. The journeying people of God, the truth increases, the truth develops, the church develops. That's, that's the point of having a council and why we need to dig into these to let the church move forward for God's sake. So, let's go back to that first document um, and see what it's saying now. Mother Church earnestly desires that all the faithful should be led to that fully conscious and active participation in the liturgical celebrations which is demanded by the very nature of liturgy. Such participation by the Christian people as a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a redeemed people, is their right and duty by reason of their baptism. This, I think, is a foundational idea that leads to the people of God and changes everything. The council takes seriously how does baptism change us? Because for so long that was viewed as secondary to maybe ordination. That's how one was really a member of the church, or religious vows, right? Religious priests, they're really the church, and everybody else comes there on Sunday. And instead, the council is saying, no, by baptism you become a royal priesthood. <laughs> baptism makes you a priest. That's going to be a hard concept to deal with because we have a lot of tradition behind us that says, no, no, <laughs> ordination makes you a priest. So what are they talking about by reviving this biblical notion? So, for instance, Thomas Aquinas, the greatest theologian the church has ever known, but perhaps he can be updated a bit. <laughs> This is the operative theology, certainly 50 years before the council. But the inheritance of the council, now there's other people trying to push this forward in the days of the council, that's why it, it can happen, but it's, um, it's not widely adopted. There's a lot of pushback against it. So let's look at Thomas Aquinas specifically on the question of whether it belongs to a priest alone to consecrate the Eucharist. Right, because that's what priests do. They have the power to confect. So here is his answer from the Summa Theologiae. I answer that as stated above. Such is the dignity of this sacrament, the Eucharist, that it is performed only as in the person of Christ. We're going to use a lot with that person of Christ because that's going to break open for us. Now, whoever performs any act in another's stead, Christ's stead, right, must do so by the power bestowed by such a one, Christ, in this case. But as the power of receiving this sacrament is conceded by Christ to the baptized person, so likewise the power of consecrating the sacrament on Christ's behalf is bestowed upon the priest at his ordination. Maybe I said that too quickly, but as the power of receiving this sacrament is conceded by Christ upon baptism. So the power of accomplishing it is given at ordination. So at ordination, the priest is put upon a level with them to whom the Lord said, do this in commemoration of me. Therefore, it must be said that it belongs to priests to accomplish this sacrament. So with this 
theology of Thomas Aquinas, the priest is the one who is active at Eucharist, and the role of the baptized, the people of God, is to passively receive. They're not active in this sacrament. Now, that's a, a technical, Thomistic sense of active and passive, but technical and Thomistic senses get lost often. And what it really had become is that the priest and maybe some other ministers were active, and everybody there in the pew was passive in the ritual. And so it didn't have the power to move them like it should, and they weren't taking their role as priests in some sense. So, this is the big idea that is contained in this, in that first document about the liturgy. Then let's move to one of the later documents, Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the church. The thing about Lumen Gentium is it was being discussed right as the first document was being approved. So there's a lot of connection. What is being discovered because Sacrosanctum Concilium, we're, we're finishing with, we're all happy with, we're approving that, and now we're talking about this next document on the church, and so the ideas are moving across, but they're modifying. So, this understanding of the people of God. The notion of the people of God first, appears first in Schema 17, which becomes Lumen Gentium. It's a... It's a these schemas were given to the members, and this one was on the church itself. And in that, there was this, the people of God, by which it meant the laity. So we'll talk about the, church, the hierarchical church, and then let's talk about the people of God, the laity. This happened, right, is there approving Sacrosanctum Concilium, recognizing that, wait a minute, but the, the laity, all the baptized are priests, right? And they all should be active at Eucharist. So something needs to change. Something isn't right here, people noticed. And so they decided to take this notion of the people of God, which came later attached to the laity, separate it out from the laity and put it as the second chapter of the document, the people of God. After an introduction, the people of God, by which it meant all the baptized, all the faithful, the whole church are the people of God. And that thinking about the church would start with the whole church united. By that, it changes the whole the flow that follows, because what you say about the bishops are in relation to the whole, and you've already established that there is this whole thing that has different people will have different roles and different responsibilities within, but that can't separate them off, or no part of that can colonize the work or the being of the whole church. So, this notion, the people of God, it's used 101 times in the documents of the Second Vatican Council. 101 times. It doesn't appear in the first two documents that are promulgated because, of course, they're being promulgated when this term comes up. When this, wait a minute, people of God, we're thinking about this wrong. So it's not in Sacrosanctum Concilium, and it's not in the other one, which is uh, Inter Marifica. It's, this is a document on social communication. It's also not in the document on the Oriental churches. Um, I suspect that's because that document is trying to use language that we agree with the Oriental churches on. So don't throw in a new term that's unique to us and we're just finding into that. But hard to say, I haven't researched why isn't that there, but it would make sense. But in every other document, people of God appears. So this is Lumen Gentium, uh, paragraph 10. This is in the second chapter on the people of God. And this is the, the second paragraph of that paragraph. 
And it, uh, it deals with the fact of how are we going to think about then the priesthood of all the baptized compared to the priesthood of the ordained. So it starts. Though they differ from one another in essence and not only in degree, the common priesthood of the faithful and the ministerial or hierarchical priesthood are nonetheless interrelated. Each of them, in its own special way, is a participation in the one priesthood of Christ. So that's important to see. Everyone of the people of God share in the one priesthood, which is Christ's priesthood. It doesn't belong to any of us. And they differ in essence, not just in degree. Then it goes on. The ministerial priest, by the sacred power he enjoys, teaches and rules the priestly people, acting in the person of Christ. He makes present the Eucharistic sacrifice and offers it to God in the name of all the people. But the faithful, all the baptized, in virtue of their royal priesthood, which is rediscovered in that first document, or reaffirmed, join in the offering of the Eucharist. They likewise exercise that priesthood in receiving the sacraments, in prayer and thanksgiving, in the witness of a holy life, and by self-denial and active charity. Now, there's a question still in my mind whether this is, whether there's one particular movement going on here. They likewise exercise, oh no, right before that, but the faithful in virtue of the royal priesthood join in the offering of the Eucharist. According to Thomas Aquinas, who offers the Eucharist? The priest, the ordained priest. The other people receive, so they don't join in the offering. They receive the offering. Now that had already started to move before the council, and this is important. How active do we see all the priestly people of God being? Pope Pius XII, and this is in one of his many speeches, this is the, I can't remember the, the Latin name of this book, AAS, but it's his daily speeches from 1947. And this is where he's trying to push the faithful to be more active, not in the Thomistic sense, but more active at liturgy. Pay attention, <laughs> do something, enter into the sacrament as you can. And so he says, the faithful on their side are responsible for the receiving, which is what Thomas Aquinas said, right? So he's siding with Thomas Aquinas. And consent with all their soul to transform their lives. That's our part. If we're going to be there, we need to commit to transform ourselves. Everything is offered. The graces of the sacrifice of the altar, the sacraments and sacramentals. They accept them not in a passive way, simply taking them in, but with an act of will and with all their strength, and especially by participating in liturgical offices or at least fervently following their process or their progress. So the faithful's job, there are extraordinary ministers there, other liturgical ministers. Do that or at least pay attention, but even more than that, let this affect you. Change your life. Now, so far, we haven't left Thomas Aquinas at all, except realizing that something is wrong because people aren't being active. People aren't paying attention. So then he comes out later with Mediator Dei, and he moves the, the argument forward a little more. He's talking about the active role of people in the consecration. He said what that is and is not based on. So he's still not moving to Thomas Aquinas, and he, moving away from Thomas Aquinas. He's still holding that. But he says the active role of the people in consecration is based on the fact that the people unite their hearts in praise, impetration, expiation, and thanksgiving with prayers or intention of the priest, even of the high priest himself, so that and this is the important part, 
so that in the one and same offering of the victim, and according to a visible sacerdotal rite, they may be presented to God the Father. That is, the people have an active role presenting themselves along with the offering of Christ on the altar so that they can be lifted up with Christ to God. All of our role is to be offered with Christ on the altar as a perfect sacrifice, as Christ was. Now there's something that Thomas Aquinas hadn't considered. It moves a little past him. It doesn't disagree with him. But I'm going to say things, though, change because now people have an active role. And what was the point of this liturgy anyway? Just to offer Christ again? No, the point was to offer ourselves. The Eucharist is for us, to make us holy, to reform us as the body of Christ. And so if we are offering ourselves so that we may be lifted up, then we have an active part in the sacrifice that is the Mass. You see, all the people of God now have an active part. Beyond simply, when you get out of here, reform your life. At that moment, we're active. Now, how far we want to push that, I'm, I'm working on that. And I haven't seen much writing on this, so I need, I need help thinking about that. So if you have an opinion, you know, feel free to share it. But so let's go back to Lumen Gentium 10. So this is what it said before, this joining in the offering of the Eucharist. Pius XII said, they likewise exercise the priesthood in receiving, right? In receiving. But the joining in can't be simply in receiving. The joining in can't simply be in the witness of a holy life by self-denial, by active charity, because it's listed as something different here. This is what I wonder about in Lumen Gentium. This joining in the offering of the Eucharist is listed as something different than in addition to everything we thought that the baptized were supposed to do before. So this is something new that we're still trying to figure out. But now I want to talk about a, an obviously true changing paradigm that happened during the council and has been accepted by the church today. Changing from a notion of the person of Christ to the person of Christ, the head, for the ordained priest. We're going to see a, a, a change in language that signifies a big change in thinking. So, the person of Christ. Uh, it's a term that comes up in the documents of Vatican II. It refers to Jesus Christ himself in Lumen Gentium V. The person of Christ himself, if you encountered him, you encounter the body of Christ and the kingdom of God is made available to you. But then it talks, it refers to ordained priests five times. And I give you the, the records there. Just that phrase. And that was common. That comes back, remember we saw that in Thomas Aquinas. The person who is consecrating has to act in the person of Christ because only Christ can consecrate. But then one of the last documents to be dealt with in the council was the document on priests. Uh, that's the presbyter... I always get these right. Presbyter presbyterum ordinus. Okay, so in 13, it's still using uh, person of Christ. But in the second paragraph, it uses a new term, the person of Christ, the head. And he uses it in a very forceful way. Here's what it says. When it's talking about what is priesthood now, finally the Second Vatican Council is getting around to saying, what is ordained priesthood? And it said the office of priests, office so you get ordained to it, since it is connected with the Episcopal order, also in its own degree, shares the authority by which Christ builds up and sanctifies and rules his body. Wherefore, the priesthood, while it indeed presupposes the sacraments of Christian initiation, baptism, confirmation, 
is conferred by that special sacrament. Through it, priests, by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, are signed with a special character and are conformed to Christ the priest in such a way that they can act in the person of Christ the head. It's defining what is unique about ordination now is not acting in the person of Christ. It's acting in the person of Christ the head. Not disagreeing, but see, that's more specific. And it makes sense of now, why is ordination about leadership, about teaching, about leading the community? Because you're acting in the person of Christ the head. Now, that's an idea that comes in at the end of the council. Because at the beginning of the council, priests are simply referred to as acting in the person of Christ. But at the end, it's the person of Christ the head. When we look now at the catechism of the Catholic Church, we'll see that it adopts this language fairly consistently, showing that it noticed the difference and has integrated that into what we would call standard Catholic theology. So it uses the term person of Christ eight times and person of Christ the head five times. First, the person of Christ, Jesus is used five times, is referred to as the person of Christ. And then the ordained priests are mentioned three times. Twice in paragraph 1548 and once in 1566. But for one thing, in all of those, what it's doing is directly referring to the language from the Vatican II documents or documents in the church of the past. So it's intentionally not changing the language of these old documents. But then in 1548, it has a, a heading, the person of Christ the head. <laughs> and it explicitly says, as it's mentioning the person of Christ, ah, but really, it's the person of Christ the head now. And here's what it says. In the ecclesial service of the ordained minister, it is Christ himself who is present to his church as head of his body, shepherd of his flock, high priest of the redemptive sacrifice, teacher of truth. This is what the church means by saying that the priest, by virtue of the sacrament of holy orders, acts in the persona Christi Capitis, the person of Christ the head. Christ is the source of all priesthood, the priest of the old law was a figure of Christ, and the priest of the new law acts in the person of Christ. So it's maintaining that person of Christ, but saying, really, ordination is about acting in the person of Christ, the head. Why does it need to do that? Because who acts in the person of Christ? All oh, the baptized. Now, it's not going to use explicitly that language, but it, it is freeing it up. And I think that's the implication. That's the reason. If baptism binds us onto the body of Christ, then when we act, we act in the person of Christ. Now that's, that's a change that matters. That's, that's a way of thinking that really challenges people to be real Christians. Step up and be Christ's presence in the world, which is our call. So then it has to deal with bishops, of course. What are bishops then? Well, first it's the, the fullness of ordination is the bishops. But then it, it goes two ways with the bishops, and this is something new, and I just include it so that we see the people of God in context. The people of God are not amorphous. <laughs> different parts of the people of God serve a different function. And it's because the people of God need people to serve this function. So the bishops aren't the church, really. They serve the church in a particular way. And in Vatican II, they kind of serve the church in two ways. One is by being a college. And so in, uh, in paragraph 22 of Lumen Gentium, just as in the gospel, the Lord so disposing, St. Peter and the other apostles constitute one apostolic college and then it points to the history of the church. You know, bishops used to act collegially. <laughs> and so it's holding that up as the new paradigm of what it means to be a bishop. This acting collegially. 
And by that, they bind the church on earth together into one church. And then the, the other side of that, then it comes in the following paragraph, bishops in their diocese. So the collegial union is apparent also in the mutual relations of the individual bishops with particular churches and with a universal church. Particular church means a diocese. The Roman pontiff as successor of Peter is perpetual and visible principal foundation of unity of both bishops and the faithful. The individual, the individual bishops, however, are the, and this is what I want to parse out, the visible principle and foundation of unity in their particular churches. So, think about that first, though. What is the principle of unity in the church? The Holy Spirit, right? It's the Holy Spirit that binds us into the body of Christ. It's the Holy Spirit that makes the church. The bishop doesn't make the church. What is the bishop, then? The bishop is the visible principle and foundation of unity. That is, by having one bishop for an area, we now have a visual unity. We're in union with him, which bespeaks our unity one to another. Not having multiple people in charge, so nobody knows who's in charge, but who's really in charge? God. (laughs) But to make that visible, it's proper to have one bishop who establishes the church in an area. And since the bishop visibly establishes the church in an area, then, as this says, he's one of a college, and that collegiality establishes the unity of the church around the world. So the bishop, as a member of a college, is organically connected to him being alone in his diocese. And instead of having the diocese our branch offices... <laughs> of the main company in Rome, each diocese is holy church, but not the whole church. And they're in a communion as the bishops represent by being members of a college for the church throughout the world. A beautiful vision of why we need bishops and what they do. So now, Gaudium et Spes. This is a document I want to finish with because it challenges with, so what should this lead us to do? If we are the people of God, if we are the priestly people of God, then what should we do? In Gaudium et Spes 43, it talks about the two cities. It's making reference, of course, to St. Augustine, right? The city of man and the city of God. But it's going a different way from those people who say, ne'er the twain shall meet. And this is what it says. This council exhorts Christians as citizens of two cities to strive to discharge their earthly duties conscientiously and in, in response to the gospel spirit. That is, to act in the city of God by religious motives and to see that as their religious response to God. They are mistaken who, knowing that we have here no abiding city, right? This isn't, we're strangers in a strange land here. And yet, it is mistaken uh, to seek one which is to come, to think that they can therefore shirk their earthly responsibilities. For they are forgetting that by the faith itself, they are more obliged than ever to measure up to these duties each according to his proper vocation. If we're part of the people of God, each of us is given a ministry. Each of us is given a vocation. Some of that is within the church, some of that is without the church. But that doesn't make it an unnecessary vocation or unconcerned with spreading the gospel in the world. We need it all. So, I skip a little section because 43 goes on and on. (laughs) But here's another later in 43. 
secular duties and activities belong properly, although not exclusively, to laymen. Right? Because the, the laity are those who are baptized, but neither ordained nor in religious vows. So ordination would orient them to serving the church as a leader, and religious vows would be serving the church in a particular charism according to the order in which they made vows. So let the layman not imagine that his pastors are always such experts that to every problem which arises, however complicated, they can readily give him a concrete solution or even that such is their mission. Rather, enlightened by Christian wisdom and giving close attention to the teaching authority of the church, let the layman take on his own distinctive role. Right? Don't look for the, the clergy. They may be guiding the church, but they shouldn't be guiding you in your vocation. God gave you a brain. Use it. <laughs> Figure it out. You are the owner of that ministry. And even if it's secular, it's a ministry of the church. Now, right, we hear some laughs, right? Because this is, this is not how we normally thought about it. Or, you know, on Leave it to Beaver, it didn't always look that way. And I would say it compares, it shows a little difference here. And uh, in this Keys to the Council that we're, we're pushing as a good book, if you want to learn a little more, um, he points out any, any parallels this passage with um, this document, uh, Vehementer Nos, Our Beloved Brothers, that Pope Pius X wrote to the people of France after France um, secularized itself and outlawed the church. And so this is oh, 1907 or something like that, 1911, something in there. But he assures them how wrong they are for marginalizing the role of the clergy in French secular society. And he says the church is essentially an unequal society. That is a society compromising two categories uh, of persons. I think I got a typo there. The pastors and the flock. Those who occupy a rank in the different degrees of the hierarchy and the multitude of the faithful. So distinct are these categories that with the pastoral body only rests the necessary right and authority for promoting the end of the society and directing all its members towards that end, the one duty of the multitude is to allow themselves to be led and like a docile flock to follow the pastors. <laughs> That's different, right? I mean, we have moved. We have moved. And we move for the sake of the mission of the church and recognizing the great thing God has done in baptism, forming a people of God. So let me end with this then. What is called for when there is disagreement? Because, of course, there's always a question in any particular situation, so who is going to lead? And whose opinion counts? And Gaudium et Spes gave us a great insight into that. It happens rather frequently and legitimately so that with equal sincerity some of the faithful would disagree with others on a given matter. This is talking about all the faithful, right? All the people of God, ordained and not. Now, not that we ever really, hardly ever happens, right? Disagreement among the faithful on different matters. No, no, no. Even against the intentions of their proponents, however, solutions proposed on one side or another may be easily confused by many people with the gospel message. That is, people on one side or the other might align their views with the gospel, which means the views on the other side, what, are you the antichrist? <laughs> I got the gospel on my side. Hence, it is necessary for people to remember that no one, no one, one. Can't mean the Pope here, I'm sure. In specific circumstances, the Pope can do this. It's not no one is allowed in the aforementioned situations to appropriate the church's authority for his own opinion. 
they should always try to enlighten one another through honest discussion, preserving mutual charity and caring above all for the common good. Maybe we haven't quite fully enfleshed this directive of the Second Vatican Council. But that is our call if we are all the people of God equally. Equally. 